lives today, God, as only you can. Father, we're gathered for one reason, and that's to celebrate your son, what he's done in our life. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've looked at heaven. You know, we spent a long time looking at the end times and what is to come, talking about the, uh, the next event on God's calendar, but we've been looking the last several weeks, three, and this is the fourth to be exact, about heaven and all the incredible things of heaven. And so I know, because I've had questions about it, there he mentions heavens in the passage we just read. And so there's a question. I answered it a couple of weeks ago, but I want to just answer it again to kind of allow you to move on in our train of thought. Here Peter says the heavens. Well, there's, there's the way that the Bible looks at the heavens in the Old Testament, because we're going to look at the Old Testament in just a second, is there three heavens. It's kind of how the Bible looks at it. That is the atmosphere that we breathe. The Bible looks at as one heaven. Then there's space. That's a second heaven. And then the third heaven that Peter's talking about here would be the realm in which God dwells. People always ask, where is that realm? We talked about that. Remember I told you even the, the Harvard, the Ivy League schools say that there's probably ten realms within our galaxy that we cannot see. And we remember we said that obviously if the scientists, the top scientists of our day in the Ivy League schools say that there's probably ten other realms in, contained within the galaxy in which we live in that we can't see, obviously one of those could be heaven. So we have the three heavens. And here Peter says there's coming a day. <coughs> just a habit to cough that part of the sermon. I'm sorry. Peter says there's coming a day. In which God is going to redo those. He's going to redeem them. And we've, we've talked about that. But there's this obvious question that we have to ask ourselves. What difference does being a Christian make? Listen to what Peter says. Look closely with me there in Scripture. Verses 10 and 11. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with the Lord, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up, dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on them will be exposed. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what kind or what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness? And then verse 14, therefore, beloved, since you're waiting for these, what do we do, Peter says, while we're waiting for heaven to appear? Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. So again, here's the question. When you get saved, you become a citizen of God, a citizen of heaven. What difference should that make in our lives? You know, you being a citizen of America, it makes a huge difference <coughs> than being a citizen of another country. So let's look at the Bible. Let's see what, what Jesus said, what the Bible tells us, and is very clear about the difference of heaven. It's great to study about heaven. I love to study about heaven. It's great to look forward to all that we have, but getting your heart, getting saved, becoming a citizen of heaven, what's that got to do with today? First thing is we need to look at heaven in the Old Testament. People ask often about heaven in the Old Testament, why it's not mentioned a lot, and it's not mentioned a great deal. But here's what you have to understand. This is why so many people get confused with the Bible. Is every book was written for a particular reason. When you and I go to a, a, a bookstore, there's a manual on how to fix a car. There is a novel. And then you, you understand those books are all equally valid and true. But they're written with different purposes. Well, the key to interpreting scripture correctly is understanding why each book was written. Well, the Old Testament was written for one purpose with its collection of books, and the New Testament was written for another purpose. The Old Testament was written for the purpose, it is a book of beginnings. We have the beginning of the cosmos. We have the, the beginning of human life. We have the beginning of God's covenant with his Hebrew, the Hebrew people. We have the beginning of God uh, moving and, and stirring with the people. The end times, what you and I have been studying for a couple of months now, they're not really focused or brought up or talked about a great deal in the Old Testament. So what the Old Testament kind of, kind of does is the Old Testament kind of looks at the, 
the here and now and the difference that a relationship with God makes now. Well, when you get over to the New Testament, there's kind of a, a the, the, old, the New Testament is written so that we understand the difference that a relationship with God makes now and then. But what we do, or what they did in the Old Testament is, they looked at and they concentrated on the relationship with, with God now at the cost of the future. Well, the New Testament was written to marry together the two. And Jesus does that. But what we do is we make the same mistake on the opposite end of the spectrum that the Old Testament saints did. Is they looked at the here and now and their relationship with God at the cost of the future. But what we do now is we look at the there, the beyond, the thereafter at the cost of the present. But the New Testament never meant it that way. So as you look at the Old Testament, they had an understanding of heaven. You don't see heaven talked about a great deal because they don't have the kind of understanding that we have now. You look at the Old Testament prophets. Job referred to heaven. Elijah, David, Daniel, many of the Old Testament prophets, that's what Peter says right in that passage. But now let's look at heaven in the New Testament. Remember, the ideal of the New Testament, the purpose of its writing, was to marry the relationship with God and to look at what is to come. And so there's a major difference, if you will, in the New Testament. And that difference is summed up in one word. You do well to write this down somewhere. That word is urgency. Urgency. In other words, the place and the reality of where we will spend all of eternity, the place after death, was a clear, very clear thing. But the question we will look at today is how does that affect us in our lives today, in our everyday life, our day-to-day -day tasks, in our behavior, in our living? Jesus lumps all of this together. And he lumps all of it together under one topic that will affect all of us. And the theme and the topic that he uses is this, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. As you look at that, you see the Old Testament wedded together. We often hear people talk about, even I heard Randy this morning, I thought as he was praying, I hadn't discussed it with him, but I was glad that he did pray about building the kingdom of God, building God's kingdom. So when Jesus talked about heaven, remember he's taking the Old Testament teachings, that's what the book of Matthew does. Have you ever read through the book of Matthew? You don't see a lot in the book of Mark about the kingdom of heaven because Mark was written to Roman pagans, people that were not religious. But the Jews had spent all their life living in, being the people of God, and what Jesus did was he said, listen, the here and now is not all there is to life. That's what cripples churches today is we cannot see beyond our front door. And it's a bad thing. But then you have other churches that miss the reality of the fact, and when I say churches, I mean people, because people are the churches. I don't mean the buildings. I don't even mean the designations. I mean you and I, believers, citizens of the kingdom of God. What cripples us is two mindsets, is we are no good to God because we can't see beyond the here and now, the day to day, with look toward the future, in living for the future and how that impacts us, or we have no care for today because we feel we have insurance tomorrow. And Jesus weds the two. When you read the book of Matthew, what he's doing is he's taking that Old Testament understanding of that we're people of God and we live as the people of God today, and he's beginning to wed it together, saying, but there is more to life than just the here and now. And he uses that phrase, the kingdom of God. And he says there's no separating the here and now and the then and there or tomorrow if we're citizens of God. Can somebody explain to me what I just said? Let me explain to you more simply. The moment you get saved, you are 
or you become a citizen of heaven with all the rights and privileges of citizenship. That means that we should behave accordingly because there's responsibilities. And so as we look at it this morning, what does that have to do with us? What it has to do with us is this. As we look at what Jesus said about the kingdom, then I want us to consider how does that impact us today? What difference does it make you being a citizen of heaven? In the way we live today, you know, you're being a citizen of America, it has some implications. Being a citizen of heaven has some implications. So the first thing we need to do is look at Jesus. Now I want you to think through. Here's one of the, the major things for us to understand better about heaven. To experience more of the benefits and the privileges of being a child of God. You must have a correct understanding of Jesus. We usually don't have a very good understanding of Jesus. When we look at Jesus today, we usually look at him as a servant. And when you read about his teachings and you see his life and you follow his life, you can get into the idea that Jesus is today a servant. Jesus today is not a servant. Jesus is king. <coughs> Jesus is king of the kingdom that he preached about, that he taught about. And if we're saved, we're subjects. Citizens of that kingdom. We're the servants. He is the king. I want you to stop for a second. If you don't get anything else I tell you today, you need to understand that. Most preachers preach Jesus as a servant today. He is not. He is king today. If you're a citizen, do you know what it means to be a subject of a king? If you're a citizen of heaven, you're the servant. See, that has everything to do with understanding this concept of the kingdom. And so we have to understand our roles, and we have to understand his expectations. So let's look at the kingdom a little closer. One of the first things that Jesus teaches is the kingdom is closer than we realize. Luke 10, 9, he says, as he sends out the 72 witnesses there, as Jesus is training up the disciples, he sends out 72 disciples. They go all over the country and they're healing and they're doing all these things. And there's this story there. I love it. Right there in Luke 10, verse 9. And as he's healing this person, they ask about the kingdom of God. They ask about heaven. And they ask about, they're looking for Jesus to come. They're looking for the Messiah to come and set up the kingdom of God. Where God reigns and where we're protected and cared for. Jesus looks at the, the person that is healed and he says, the kingdom of heaven is near to you now. When you were saved, the kingdom of heaven was near to you then. What does that mean? Does that mean that he was going to come that day and set up his kingdom where everything is righted and where he is there personally with us to care for us? Or does that mean you soon will die? No. Listen to me very closely. Here's what all that means. It means that the kingdom is in Jesus. And for us to be subjects, the only way we can become a subject is by placing our faith in Jesus. And to go to heaven, we must be a subject of the kingdom. But for the here and the now, it has implications. When Jesus spoke of the subject again, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they gathered together. And they wanted to know when was Jesus going to set up his kingdom. And do you understand? Look at me for a second. That's why so many of you like to hear preaching on heaven. You want to know <coughs> what heaven's going to be like. But I feel kind of like the prophets sometimes. It's awesome. I love studying about heaven. But Jesus was trying to explain to his people then that you're missing the point of a relationship with me. The kingdom or heaven doesn't start sometime in the future. It starts when you get saved. Listen to what he said. The Pharisees gathered around, the lawyers gathered around, and they said, Jesus, tell us which one of the commandments is most important. It, it, let me translate that. How do we get to heaven? 
How do we see God's kingdom come in his fullness? Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. He didn't mean he was getting ready to set up his kingdom. He didn't mean that that guy was about to die and go on to heaven. I want you to listen to me very closely. You do not become a citizen of heaven when you die. You become a citizen of heaven when you're reborn. Do you understand the implications? To become a citizen of heaven, you have to be subject to the kingdom. Matthew 18, 3, he said it this way. Truly I say to you, unless you turn or repent and become like a child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Yes, there's coming a day when all of us will gather together in paradise. But to be a child of God and to be in that kingdom, to see heaven, the kingdom starts now. Even the disciples didn't understand that. Listen to what they said in Acts 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked Jesus, this is after his resurrection. They said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In other words, boys, you still don't get it, do you? Can I be honest with you? As a communicator, I can see on your faces you are in the same boat with the disciples. And what I know as a preacher is, not that I'm above you, but I know it because I talk to you and I listen to you. It's a hard thing to understand. We're right there with them. Can you get your arms around the understanding that not when you die, you'll have the rights of citizenship. But it is when you are born again, you have the rights of citizenship. Let me put it this way. People often ask me, Pastor, I'm having problems with sin in this area. As a citizen of America, you have certain rights and privileges, right? But we don't exercise all of them. And if you don't exercise those rights and those privileges, what are they? They're lost. They're really not useful to you if you don't exercise them. But if you're a citizen of America and you exercise those rights and privileges, that's what makes our country better than any other country on the face of the earth. If you're born again and there's areas of sin that you struggle with and you're defeated in, you need to understand you don't have to be or stay defeated because you are a citizen with rights and privileges. Now, I, I can't stand here and talk about each and, each and every one of you, but the day in my Christian life, and I realized that. I remember I was headed to work in a factory. And I remember where I was. I remember the car I was driving. I remember the pants I was wearing. I remember everything as clear that day, maybe more clear that day than the day I got saved, when that, that switch flipped in my mind that freedom wasn't coming someday when I died and went to heaven. It was available today. But like all rights and privileges, it's up to you to exercise those. Part of being in the citizen, being a citizen in the kingdom of heaven is this, is building the kingdom today. What does it look like to build the kingdom today? That's what we were left for. What does that mean? What does it look like? Being a citizen of, of God, being saved, being saved today, being a citizen and having rights and privileges doesn't mean that you and I are going to be building Jasper walls. Doesn't mean we're going to be paving the streets out there with gold. What it means is, is you and I are citizens. We've been set free. The curse has been lifted. Yeah. 
But it means when we build the kingdom of God, if you heard Randy pray, Lord, help us build the kingdom of God, James, <coughs> never am I going to ask you to pay the streets out there with gold. But our job is to lead others to faith in Christ that the curse may be lifted in their lives. So how do we do that? That means there's more to being a Christian than just getting saved and waiting on death to happen for something to come. One of the things it means is as we lead others, the way that we do that is our lifestyle. And so as we look at that, there's a hiddenness to the kingdom of heaven. There, there's an elusiveness to the kingdom of God. So what we're talking about is a mystery. All of you that go to college or different ones of you that have been through school and college and you have these different people, even when you watch the news, all of you can relate to this and you see people ridicule our faith. Let me, let me explain this to you. They're always looking for evidence. They always want hardcore facts. Why are you a believer? How, how can you convince me to be a Christian? There's this hiddenness to the kingdom of heaven. But the kingdom of heaven is here today in reality. Everything I've talked about, the freedom from the curse, the freedom from sin, all of that is ours today. But many times we ask the same questions of where is it? How do we see it? How do we put our arms around it? But there's a, a hiddenness to it. And, and I'm talking about a mystery. In the New Testament, Peter and Paul refer to the gospel and to the kingdom of God as a mystery. What is a mystery? A mystery is something... That is hidden from folks, but is revealed to others. Now, I want you to listen to me very closely when we're talking about our faith. Jesus said it this way. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Lost people just don't understand <coughs> salvation. They just don't understand what it means to be a citizen of heaven. But you and I can and should understand. The Bible says it's a mystery. The Christian faith, listen, you have lost people that ask this question. You ever had them say, well, I don't understand why you're a Christian. Explain this to me. So you sit down and you give them your best canned ABCs of the gospel. And they look at you like you've got spiders crawling out your nose, right? And they say, I just don't get it. Look up here for a second. Church, this is real important. This is what the whole issue of heaven is about. You cannot discover in a land heaven. Philosophers cannot sit around and search out heaven. They won't discover. I'm not saying that our faith is not rational, factual, but I want you to understand something. You become a member of of the kingdom of heaven and only then do you begin to understand because when your heart is changed when it is set free from the curse that's a supernatural thing that you can't reproduce in the lab there are no 10 step programs to that kind of treatment and yet people ridicule it and they ridicule it's natural to ridicule what you can't understand so how do I become a citizen of heaven? How do I enter heaven? Let me explain it to you. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Not do many mighty works in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Apparently, it's possible to be lost and be very orthodox or religious. Right? So how does one become a citizen of heaven? Because until you understand how one becomes a citizen of heaven, you're never going to understand how to explain it to those that are not. The Bible tells us this story. Let me read it to you. I want you to think with me for a second. The story comes out of Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. And again Jesus spoke to them in the parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared 
to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and they went off. No one or one to his farm and under his business while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, killed them, and the king was angry. And he sent his troops and he destroyed those murderers and burned their cities. And then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready. But those invited, they're not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out on the roads and they gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. He's talking about citizenship. So obviously the invitation is an open invitation, and the invitation is given to many. But as you look at this story about this wedding, there's a, a very significant point to the story. Jesus is describing the kingdom of heaven to them. And he's talking about how do you gain entrance into it. And so the invitations were sent. And then there were some who didn't care. We see that every day in our lives. Some just aren't interested in the gospel. Some just don't care. Then you see one that comes in and he didn't have the right garment. Do you know what that means? You can't come just any old way. You can't get to heaven on your own or by your own rules. Think of the arrogance of telling the king what are the rules of his kingdom. So it requires, look up here, we get confused as Baptists and we think about giving out invitations and we argue about who can, who can get to heaven and who can't. We miss the whole point of the fact that just because you've been sent an invitation really doesn't mean you're going to eat. <clears throat> Listen to what Jesus said. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? What is he talking about? Well, he's talking about repentance. Matthew 3, 2, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? It means everybody you know that doesn't know Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is right here. It's right here. It's close. It's right there in front of them. It means in order to become a, king, a citizen of the kingdom, you have to humble yourself. And you have to humble yourself and surrender your will that's what the Bible calls repentance. What does that mean? What does it mean to humble yourself? What does it mean to repent? What does it mean to surrender your will? Let's suppose, TJ and I, I hope he doesn't mind me using him, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, hope he doesn't mind. We talked about his car last night. And he's got a car he's been working on. And it'd be awesome. TJ said, here, here, Pastor. He threw me the keys and he said, here, take my car, give her a whirl down the street. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? That'd be nice of him, wouldn't it? But at the end of the day, I don't know TJ as well as some of you, but I'm guessing you know what TJ's going to want back? <laughs> He's going to want his car keys back, isn't he? But you look at me very, very close for a minute. We think salvation the same way. You gather in a crowd like this, you pray a prayer, and you hand Jesus the keys for a little. And you tell him, you can borrow me, but come Monday, I'm going to want those back. What if TJ said, here, Pastor, I love your brother, and he signed over 
the car and gave me the title. What would that be? Besides Austin. <laughs> what would that mean? That mean that when TJ said, I start thinking I want my car back, <laughs> I hate it. God bless you, I love you, but I like the fool. And if TJ said, I'm going to call the police, what would the police say? Too sad, too bad, but it's in pastor's name. See, that's what citizenship is really about. I'm not interested, nor is God interested, if you sat through the service, listened to the preacher, and prayed a prayer and throwed the keys at Jesus and said, here, take it for a test spin. Salvation is when you sign the title of your life over to God. That citizenship means that God has all the rights and privileges to your life. But because he owns it and Satan no longer owns it, it means you have some rights and privileges too. And so there's a huge difference. So what does that look like? That's what we've been talking about all morning. That's where we've been headed to all morning. Number three, what does it look like to be a citizen of heaven today? What does it look like to have the curse lifted today? It looks like living different. Peter says it this way. He says, when you turn the title deed of your life over, you think different. If you knew Jesus Christ was coming back tomorrow, would you have different priorities? Would your behavior be different? Would there be changes that you would make to your life now? Let's just say for a second you were planning on becoming a doctor. If you were going to be a doctor, that means there would be certain things in your life that there would be a track, a plan that you'd put together. You want to take certain classes in college headed toward uh, school. You would want to behave a certain way because if you got in trouble with the law, guess what? It wouldn't let you to mention. It means that your path and your decision and your behaviors would be distinct and different. Your grades would have to be such that match that track. Your dedication and all those things would have to allow you to do that. And so being the citizen of heaven today is not about dying and going to heaven. Heaven is not about tomorrow. Heaven for us is about today. I'm not saying that we become so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. What do you mean? I'm totally against the model where we build a commune and we become monks. That's totally been proven to be totally off the gospel trail. I'm not saying that we just commune with Christians, we just buy from Christians, we just live around and the only friends we have are Christians. But neither are we to be so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. What does that mean? It means that we don't have to run from society, but we are to be separated in our thinking from society. We should be in and should be a part of society. We just shouldn't think separately. It means there must be a difference in our lives. There must be a difference in the way that we live our lives, in the way we think, in the way we date, in the way we behave, to be subjects of the king. You see, when I talk to you about the gospel, Yes, we must speak the gospel. I'm against this movement that says all we have to do is live and by our lives they'll see it. I think you have to speak the truth for them to understand and comprehend it. But you know what else I know? You can talk and tell the truth all day long. But for the blind eye to comprehend that truth, they must see it also. They have to. God's chosen to use us to explain salvation. He's chosen to use our lives so that the blind eyes can have an illustration of what it 
it means to be saved. Because we're the only way they can see and understand it. We're responsible to share the narrowness of the gospel. But we're also responsible to model the reality of its transforming grace. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Last week, I told you, if you talk to my friends and my family, my wife and my children, if they're honest, they won't tell you I'm the best guy in the crowd. They won't tell you I'm the best guy in the community. But I'm confident they'll tell you that I absolutely love Jesus. That I've spent my Christian life trying to live for him because of the love for him. Because of the love he's had for me. That's what they need to see. We can study about heaven all day long. But we're heaven on earth to the lost. Through that transformed life. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you a citizen of heaven? <coughs> right now, I want every one of you to look at me for a second. I'm not interested in how many bad times you've been baptized. I don't care where your, your letter sits. I don't care where you spent last night or what you did. Here's the only thing I care about today. Who has ownership of your life? Would you bow your heads for a second? When you walk out of here today, will you drive your life or will Jesus? See, that's, that's the question. That's the question that answers salvation. When, where, or did you ever sign control totally of your life over to Jesus. You can look at last week and how you lived and it'll tell you that tale. This morning, here's what I'm asking. Why don't you just right now, from your heart to his, just say, Lord, I really want the real thing. Jesus, I'm going to give you total control of my life. I'm signing it over. God, if it's real, it's up to you to change my life. That's what I did when I got saved. I couldn't change. I couldn't straighten up. I couldn't live differently. I finally had an honest conversation with God. And I said, God, I've tried church. I've tried this. I've tried it all. And I've never once changed. And so I finally had a conversation with God. And I said, Lord, if you can't change me, leave me alone. I can't stand any more of the torture. Change me or leave me alone. And he totally changed my life.